Okay, today's speaker, who's already started to celebrate, uh, Matthew Graham. It's water. Michigan. Oh, it's water. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about comics, co protagonists, and finally generated groups. All right, thank you for the invitation. It's been a good visit so far. Um, so what I want to talk about today is some generalization of the notion of convex co-compactness from Kleinian groups to finally generated groups. And the real idea here is to take these nice, take some um, geometric features from hyperbolic groups and um, hyperbolic space and extract them as kind of as far as possible to the context of finitely generated groups. Um, I'll give you kind of a, the, the, the course outline of the, the talk is to first kind of motivate from the classical definition and then to move into to see that in hyperbolic groups we can essentially give an exact translation of the setting from three manifolds, three manifold groups to, um, to hyperbolic groups. And then, um, well the idea then is to look at, okay we're going to look at what happens in the case of the mapping class group and there we have um, kind of different motivations for thinking about certain classes of hyperbolic groups of mapping class groups. And, um, this will be kind of an indication of what happens in the general case. Um, in the general case, we'll move, we'll just extract to the, to the setting of finitely generated groups, and this is this notion of stability, and these stable subgroups are going to be what are our um, convex co-compact groups of finitely generated groups. Um, and the idea there um, is that we want to have as many characterizations of this as possible. In particular, we want to recover some of the classical characterizations, and that's what I'll talk about, and that'll be part work with... Uh, Matt Cordes. Um, a lot of this is work with Sam Taylor. He and I introduced this notion of stability. Um, so once we have, the, once we've recovered um, the, the classical setting from Kleinian groups, classical characterizations, we want to talk about how do we characterize it in other groups. Um, in, the, in the case of mapping class groups, we, we care about convex co-compact subgroups because they're related to hyperbolicity of surface group extensions and surface bundles. And um, and in, the, in, in other settings, we'd also like to have other motivations. So there's this kind of a similar setup in, in the case of Adafin. And in hyper, relatively hyperbolic groups, there's other um, reasons you might care. In the context of red angle Arden groups, there are other reasons you might care. But um, the idea is that we want some way of um, characterizing stability uh, in a robust sense so that maybe we can do it in using local technology. Um, but maybe we can also do it without using local technology. And um, with work with um, Tarek Algob and Sam Taylor, we have a different characterization of stability, which lets us prove um, a theorem, which I'll call the, the PBS theorem, it's a pulling back stability theorem we'll get to, uh, which helps us realize, helps us uh, determine when a subgroup of a, a group is stable just via the an action of the ambient group on some other, other space, um, where we don't necessarily know a lot about the ambient group. Okay, so maybe none of that made sense, but hopefully by the end of this, um, some sense will be made. So let's start with this uh, classical characterization of convex field compactness. Okay, so here's a definition theorem. Um, so, uh, so we subgroup. A Kleinian group. So this is a discrete subgroup of isometries. Let's say H3. Orientation preserving. Um, it's called convex co compact. I will try not to do that as little as possible. So if any of the following equivalent conditions hold, uh, the following equivalent conditions hold. That's not a standard acronym, but I hope you know what I mean. <laughs> All right, so um, one natural place where we have a group of isometries of H3, we can look at orbit maps. So I'm just going to denote an orbit map in H3 by just kind of an action symbol. So any orbit, um, the first condition is the any orbit is QI embedded, so quasi-asymmetrically embedded. So this automatically tells you here that gamma is um, Gromov hyperbolic. And I've been told that I don't need to define that. But if you don't remember what Gromov hyperbolic means, um, if I take any geodesic triangle in the space, take three points, and I look at the geodesic triangle, then there's some delta, so that if I take the delta neighborhood of the two sides, then the third side lives inside the union of the two delta neighborhoods. 
And this is some generalization. Uh, Gromov hypervelicity is um, some generalization of um, hypervelicity, which of a uh, sorry hyperbolic space, which works well in the context of groups and other other things. Okay. Um, so the first condition is that we have this QI embedding. And the second condition is that mini orbit um, is quasi convex. So what does quasi convex mean? Draw a picture. You have you have your subspace. So this is so the subspace, and then I want to take um, I want to look at geodesics between points on the subspace. And what it says is that there's some neighborhood I can fatten up my space so that um, the geodesic stays within that bounded neighborhood of the subspace. So this is some coarse notion of convexity. Convexity would be the geodesic actually stays in the subspace. OK. Uh, and the last condition is the one that actually, well, so there's several other conditions, but the, the only one, the last one I'm going to talk about today is the one that actually gives um, this the name. OK, so the first thing um, is that, so gamma, I'll just write what it is. Gamma acts on the convex hull of the limit set of the group, so compactly. OK, so what's the picture? Um, so lambda g is the limit set the lambda gamma is the limit set of <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. Limit set of gamma um, in the boundary of H3, which is just S2. So what's the, the cartoon two-dimensional picture? I have my boundary of H3 sitting out here. I, I look at the so in this context it's the smallest um, gamma invariant subset of the boundary. And maybe it has some pieces. And then I look at all the geodesics between points in this boundary, and then I take the convex closure of that. And then the, 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 the statement is that um, gamma has um, x. If you look at the quotient of, of the action of gamma on this, um, you get something um, compact. OK. So, this is a convex thing. It acts co-compactly on it, so you call it convex co-compact. All right. Now, there are lots of reasons you want to care about these subgroups. For one, um, you see you get these um, compact manifolds in the quotient. Um, other, this is an open condition in the space of representations of the group. Um, but for us, uh, those kind of motivations are not exactly what we want to think about. Um, when we move to the general setting, what we, we're really going to be caring about is that we have, we're going to have some notion of this convex co-compactness. Um, it's going to be, we're going to have multiple characterizations of it, but though maybe the one that really matters here is that this quasi-convex thing. It's going to be a hyperbolic object sitting inside of your group or your space in a very nice way. Um, and then in given contexts, say in the case of the mapping class group or in the case of out of thin, we'll have reasons in those particular context that we care about them otherwise. Okay. All right. So let's, so two is um, the convex co-compactness in hyperbolic groups, or hyperbolic spaces. And this is a theorem of Swenson. So kind of the idea of a hyperbolic, grown of hyperbolic space is that you, it's just a generalization, sort of some, some coarse generalization of hyperbolic in space. Um, there we, so here we have geodesics. We have uh, a notion of a boundary. Um, and the group action on the boundary is very nice. Uh, so let's say, um, so uh, um, for, so if I have a subgroup of a hyperbolic group, G, um, the following are equivalent. One, so we can think about, so over here we had a group gamma of isometries of H3. Um, and then we had, we looked at the action of gamma on H3. Here we're going to be just thinking about um, a subgroup, and then we think about the, the subgroup acting on the group itself. OK, so, um, and then so I can remove this sort of looking at the orbit, and I can just talk about how the group sits inside. So H um, is a QI embedded subgroup. And the second condition is H is quasi-convex. 
And this means I take any Cayley graph of G that I want, and I look at the orbit of H in that Cayley graph, and it's always quasi-convex independent of the choice of generating set. OK, so the last condition is um, a similar one here. And what is it is that H acts co-compactly on, um, maybe I'll put a W here for a weak hall of the limit set of H. Um, OK, so here again, this is the limit set of H sitting inside of now the Gromov boundary of G. And I can draw the same cartoon picture I want here. OK. Um, all right, so this is just a nice, clean generalization. And, and the theorem that I'm going to, so the, I'm going to give you, I'm going to talk about the mapping class group next. And in the mapping class group context, um, we'll have a very similar setup here, except for we'll have to replace G by a few other things. I mean, we can't just use the mapping class group here, um, but we'll have to replace it, we'll have to replace it in, in each of these given things by something else. Um, and then the goal is to kind of remove that, remove that setup. Um, so there's a beautiful theory in the mapping class group that I'll, that I'll talk about, um, but the idea is to then actually just step back, um, move out from the context of the mapping class group and replace, take any finitely generated group and then have a very similar statement here where um, the objects are just either subsets of the group itself or some limit set in some natural boundary of the group. Okay. Three. Okay, so what is a mapping class group? Um, it's the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the surface here. I, I just want to take S to be um, some surface. I'll just take a closed surface of genus G. So here, and I want genus to be at least two. Um, so it's the orientation preserving homeomorphisms modulo um, those which are isotopic to the identity. Um, the, the spaces that I want to talk about are the Teichmuller space. The Teichmuller space, you can take to be on the space of hyperbolic structures on S. Um, of the isotopy. And the last one um, is the curve graph. Uh, like for half of you, I don't have to define it, but for the other half I do. It's a graph. Um, so this is a curve graph. So what are the vertices? These are isotopy classes of uh, simple closed curves. I'll draw a cartoon on the board over here uh, on S. And then edges, these are for disjointness. All right. Do I have no color chalk? Is that right? I didn't ask for it, so it's my fault. OK. <laughs> All right, so um, this is a terrible place to draw this picture because it's like eight of you can't see. All right. Oh, thanks. Beautiful. All right. Um, so I'll draw, it, I'll draw it here. So here's not the only surface I know how to draw, but you know. Okay. Um, here's a curve. Uh, here's a curve. Um, here's a curve. And there are lots of curves. Um, that should be enough curves. Uh, so what does this look like? This is just a very small piece of the curve graph. Um, notice that what I can, one thing I could do is I can, let me just draw the piece, small piece of the curve graph. Um, I got a blue guy, I have an orange guy, and I have Orange guy on the floor, purple guy. Um, and what are the edges? Well, my edges are for disjointness. And uh, so purple and orange are not disjoint, so they don't get an edge. But purple and green are disjoint. Um, and orange and green are not disjoint. So, uh, But one thing, notice one thing I could do is I could take this curve, this orange guy, and I could twist it, take a Dane twist around the green guy. And I could do that as many times as I want. And every time I do that, I get a different isotopic class of curves. Um, so one thing to note is that the, this, this curve graph is locally infinite. 
and kind of a crazy thing. Um, but there's a beautiful theorem of Mazur Minsky that tells us that um, that the curve graph is hyperbolic. So it's Gromov hyperbolic. Um, and that's really nice. And there's this beautiful theory called the Mazur-Minsky hierarchy machinery um, that closely, like, it somehow says that the map the geometry of the mapping class group and even of Teichmuller spaces strongly build out of curve graphs of subsurfaces. And somehow these things all fit together and there's absolutely no time for me to talk about any of that. Um, but let me really quickly talk about um, how the mapping class group acts on these spaces. So the mapping class group acts on the Teichmuller space. Um, out here I'm thinking about it with the Teichmuller metric. Somehow that doesn't matter um, for what I want to say. Um, this action, so Teichmuller space is a, is a proper um, complete uh, metric space. And the action here is proper, um, but it's not co-compact. So uh, Teichmuller space is not a perfect geometric model. Um, for the mapping class group, though it's very nice. Uh, mapping class group also acts on the curve graph. These are isotopy classes of curves. This is homeomorphisms of the isotopy. Um, so I already said that the curve graph is not, um, so it's locally infinite, so, so it's not proper. Um, but it is hyperbolic, and that's great. And the action here, um, so it's, it's not proper, obviously. Uh, um, but it is co-compact. But the, the non-properness kind of makes everything a little wonky. OK. So let me give you the characterization of convex co-compactness and what the definition of convex co-compactness is in mapping class groups. All right, so this is a notion first introduced by Farb and Mosher. Um, and then it was refined further by Hammanschott and then Kent and Leininger, or this kind of, they were um, at the same time. All right, so um, for, can we call, so we have a subgroup of the mapping class group, and convex go compact. Um, any of the following will equivalent conditions hold. Okay, so one, um, and this is the original definition. So we can look at the action of H on the Teichmuller space, and we want this orbit to be quasi convex. So that seems familiar. Two, uh, we can look at the action of H on the curve graph, and this is a QI embedding. So these two are equivalent. Three, where are we calling this convex co compact? We can look at um, H. We can look at uh, the action of H on the weak hull of the limit set of H sitting inside of PML. And this is a co compact action. So here we're thinking about um, the limit set of H sitting inside of the Thurston's compactification of Teichmuller space to projective measure lamination space. And Teichmuller space topologically is a ball. Um, this is a closed ball. And so you can really just draw the same cartoon picture that I had before of Teichmuller space being a circle. And then the limit set is, and you draw the. And here, um, the, the, the hull here is not, you don't take the convex closure, you just look at all the geodesics between the endpoints. Um, OK, so great, why do I care? <laughs> I mean, in some sense, I've just told you that uh, there's some nice way of connecting. So, can you uh, so yeah. need the metric to talk about geodesics or you take the Teichmuller? Teichmuller metric, metric yeah. yeah. Work for like no. Peterson metric or anything else? No. 
Um, well, I mean, there are a bunch of there are a bunch of metrics which are. I don't want to say this. I mean, there are a bunch of metrics that are coarsely equivalent to, that are like um, quasi isometric to the Teichmuller metric, but uh, da, 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 that's not good enough to get this quasi convexity statement. Um, but yeah, the Wade Peterson metric does not work. Um, okay, so so all I've told you is that there's this nice class of subgroups that somehow um, make all of these different settings work nicely together. And then we have something that vaguely seems um, related to this classical notion of convex co-compactness, but maybe there's some, other than the beauty of the theory, there's not, um, we maybe want a different reason to care about these things. And the following and all is that reason. So um, every subgroup of the mapping class group determines an, a surface group extension. So I'll denote this by EH and I'll draw the commuting di or the, the diagram in a second. But that uh, commutative di this uh, surface group extension is hyperbolic. So let me um, draw. So um, if I take the surface and I puncture it, there's this forgetful map from um, the punctured surface to the surface. And the, and the fundamental group, you just think about this group embeds inside this mapping class group. So it's called the point pushing subgroup. You just take your points on the surface and you just follow it around the curve. And that gives you some homeomorphism. OK, so if I take a, a subgroup of the mapping class group, well, it's embeds inside nicely. If I call this map rho, this forgetful map rho, um, then this sits inside a nice, I can take the pullback um, under this forgetful map, and I get some other subgroup. And this fits nicely into this diagram here. Um, and it turns out, so this gives you a surface group extension. Um, into the short, it's a short exact sequence. This gives you a surface group extension. It turns out that every surface group extension actually comes from some subgroup of the mapping class group. And what this theorem says is that you can characterize precisely when the surface group is hyperbolic by, well, a number of ways. Um, one is this action on Teichmuller space. The other is action on the curve graph. And then you also have this <coughs> convex co-compactness <coughs> condition about the action on the, the weak hole on the limit set, the limit set. OK, um, one thing to note um, is that um, if you remember back to this definition we had in the context of hyperbolic groups, uh, we had this, we had a geometric, we had a, the, the subgroups we were talking about, these quasi-convex subgroups of hyperbolic groups, where we had all these other characterizations. This is a geometric characterization of this subgroup in terms of the geometry of the ambient group. And, and in each of these contexts, we don't actually have that. These are all characterizations of the orbits of um, the subgroup in a kind of a, a way, uh, different spaces where we can represent more or less the geometry of the mapping class group. And um, so what I want to do now is I want to give you a way of characterizing this convex compactness in terms, purely in terms of, of the geometry of the mapping class group itself. Yeah. Okay. And this is where the stability business comes in. So let me present you, present you um, the idea here is we want to take uh, geodesics in hyperbolic space or in Gromov hyperbolic spaces satisfy a number of nice geometric characterizations. Um, and what I'm going to do is define for you one of them. And um, the way I'm going to define it, we can then see how to easily generalize this to um, the broader context of, say, geodesic metric spaces. Okay, so this is called the Morse lemma. 
Uh, so let x be a hyperbolic, uh, gamma hyperbolic. Um, oh my god. And um, gamma um, a geodesic. So let's say this is a delta hyperbolic. Delta was, I drew a little picture of a triangle that was, that was the, the neighborhoods I needed to take of the two edges. So the third edge lived in the union of the two neighborhoods. Okay, um, so then the statement is that um, if, uh, if Q is a quasi-geodesic um, with endpoints in gamma, um, and Q is uniformly close to gamma. So let me draw a picture, then I'll give you a precise statement. Um, here's the picture. So I have my, ga my geodesic gamma. Um, I pick a couple points on, on my geodesic, and then I look at some quasi-geodesic. And what this uniformness is going to say that I can draw um, a neighborhood of my geodesic gamma, and then Q has to live inside of that neighborhood. All right. Uh, let me give you the precise statement, because we're going to need this notion of a Morse stability gauge going forward. So the technical statement is as follows. Um, there exists um, some constant, sorry, sorry some uh, map from which takes in, what it does is it takes in quasi g as a constant, so additive multiplicative factor, and it spits out some non-negative number um, such that, so if q is a kc quasi g desic with endpoints on my g desic gamma, then q lives inside the n delta of k neighborhood of gamma. So um, the neighborhood, this diameter, this neighborhood does depend on the quasi-geodesic constants, but that's it. All right, so here I want to call this n function, um, this is called a, it's called a stability gauge, it's called a stability function. So you notice that if I just forget about the fact that I'm in a hyperbolic space, I can write down the same definition. I have a geodesic. I want to call it Morse or stable um, if there's some function in, so that if I pick any quasi-geodesic that lies on this endpoints, uh, within points on the geodesic, then it stays within n of the quasi-geodesic constants of that geodesic. OK, so that's the definition. Um, so, so let x um, be a metric space. Um, we say we can say a quasi geodesic, or it doesn't matter. Geodesic gamma in x is in stable or Morse um, if gamma satisfies this Morse condition. Gamma satisfies the Morse lemma. Okay. All right. So I told you a thing. Um, what are some examples, maybe? Okay. So, oh, oh and maybe I should uh, give a second definition. That uh, uh, what do I want to say? Yeah. So, if uh, G is a group. Finally, generate a group, and I have some element. And G is called Morse or stable. If uh, any orbit of G in some Cayley graph for G um, is stable, this cuts out for me a line, and I just want to say that this quasi geodesic that it cuts out. Is a stable quasi geodesic. But to understand it, before you had 
fixed geodesic, and then you were saying that things were in some dust samples of that, uh, or yeah. some neighborhood of that. So when you say something is end stable, are you comparing it to anything else? Just yeah, yeah. So there, what I'm saying is that so the, the, the idea here is that I can just forget that I'm in a hyperbolic space. And then when I say that I want to call a geodesic gamma stable, instable, if I can find this function in. And so that any quasi D does it, oh. starting and ending on it, lives oh. within this neighborhood oh, okay. where it's in of the. Great. OK. Um, so what's, what are some examples? Um, so uh, any geodesic. And hyperbolic space and delta hyperbolic space is a uniformly stable. Well, delta is stable. Um, depending only on delta. So the stability function only depends on, on delta. Um, so axes of pseudo Nasovs, you know what a pseudo Nasov is. In technical space, uh, or even in the mapping class group. So this is the theorem of Minsky. And this is the theorem of Bear stock. They're stable. Um, maybe one last example. Um, axes of Fully irreducibles or irreducibles with irreducible powers, um, elements. I think this is right. In outer space, is that the way? Yeah. In uh, outer space, elements of out of thin. Um, in outer space. Outer space is some analog of tight Muller space. R stable. Um, and this is. Uh, Algonk here. OK. So um, and maybe one last thing. If you know what an acylindrically hyperbolic group is, that um, any, uh, what's the point? So if, if G is acylindrically hyperbolic, um, so examples of these are mapping class groups out of thin. Renegal Arden groups, Renegal Coxer groups, a whole bunch of different groups. Um, so if G is asymptotically hyperbolic, and um, with G acting on X, some hyperbolic space acylindrically, um, and G, some element of G, um, acts oxidromically, on X, um, then G is a stable element in G. And this is kind of combined work of Dennis Oson and Alex Sisto. And these are very, they're, they're acylind the class of acylindrically hyperbolic groups is very large. Um, and so this kind of should tell you, hopefully tells you that there um, are a lot of examples of these things. OK. All right. So the goal is to get back to some notion of convex code compactness. This is some place to define what stable means. This is a definition um, due to Sam Taylor and myself. Um, I'm losing myself. So let's just do it in the context of groups. Um, the group, so a subgroup H here just need G to be finitely generated. Um, it's called stable. If there exists then some stability gauge N, our stability function, um, such that so I want every G does like an H. 
function is a uh, uniform stable or unstable quasi geodesic. In G. So there are two parts to this. I'm saying that if I take a geodesic in H, it becomes a quasi geodesic in G. That's just saying that H is QI embedded. Um, so H stable in G. How is it H is QI embedded? And, and the second is that if, if I look at one of these geodesics, then it's actually uniformly stable. Um, so in particular, this will tell us that. Um, H is quasi-convex with respect to any word metric. So it's worth noting that if I if I have a quasi-convex subgroup with respect to one word metric, it need not give me a quasi-convex. It need not be quasi-convex with respect to a different word metric. And that's that's one way. Place. Oh, thanks. That's yeah, yeah. That is uh, probably the main consequence, thanks. So H is going to be hyperbolic. Um, so one equivalent characterization of hyperbolicity is that every geodesic uniformly satisfies, and, and every geodesic in the space uniformly satisfies the Morse condition. Um, and this is, this is forcing that to happen. Thanks. OK, um, so what's, what's the theorem here? The theorem Sam uh, is that um, so we have some subgroup of the mapping class group. This is convex co-compact in this previous sense, if and only if um, H is stable in the mapping class group. So we had these characterizations of convex co-compactness in terms of the action on tight Moore space, in terms of the action on the curve graph, in terms of this action on this convex hull or weak convex hull um, in tight Moore space. And these weren't geometric characterizations in terms of just the geometry of the mapping class group. And so here is one such thing. Um, and um, so that's so uh, the, kind of the argument here is that. This, uh, this notion of stability gives you, at least in terms of always being, so the, the other thing I didn't mention is that if you have, a, if G is a hyperbolic group, um, then stability is equivalent to quasi-convexity. So the stability of a subgroup is equivalent to quasi-convexity in the context of hyperbolic groups. I mean, so at least in several of the cases that we care about, this notion of stability generalizes um, at least the quasi-convex condition of convex co-compactness. And the next thing I want to talk about, which I guess will probably be the last thing I'm going to talk about. Um, sorry, Chalar. Uh, is um, how to generalize this, how to generalize the, uh, the convex co-compact part of the, this action of um, the weak hole on, on of the, the limit set definition. Okay, so this is where the Morse boundary and um, boundary convex co-compactness bit. Okay, so this construction is due to various people. Um, it was first due to Charney Salton uh, for cat zero spaces. Um, then it was due to Cortez um, in the general metric space, in the general case. And then um, Cortez and Hume gave a nice refinement of it, which is the one I'm going to talk about right now. Okay. All right, so let, so let X be, uh, let's say, I think I need it to be a geodesic metric space. I need it to be a proper one. OK, I don't need proper for all of this, but um, so I just mean closed balls are compact. OK, so 
So if x is a proper geodesic metric space, then what I want to define is I want to take a stability function and I want to take a base point. So just fix some point in x, e. And I want to look at all the points that I can connect. These are all the points in x so that there exists an instable um, geodesic um, between e and y. So I'm, I stand on my point e, and I look at. I just want to see the only all the points that I can connect to via geodesic that's nice and stable. So, a very nice observation about this is that. Cortez and Hume, is that um, um, so for any, if I pick, fix my stability function, um, there exists some hypervelicity constant such that x and e is delta n hyperbolic. Um, and I don't mean in the general, so th this isn't necessarily a geodesic, x and e is not necessarily a geodesic space, um, but it, uh, so this, this definition of hyperbolicity is the Gromov product definition of hyperbolicity. OK, so what does this mean? I can take my hyperbolic space, and I can look at its Gromov boundary. So this is just some nice hyperbolic space. It has a Gromov boundary. And what do I want to do now that I have a Gromov boundary? Um, so the first, before I wanted to find a, a big boundary of the, the whole ambient space. Um, so hopefully. Uh, you imagine if I let this function grow, then eventually I collect the entire space. Every point, I mean, if the distance from a point to my base point is k, then you imagine there's some function that depends on k that that point can be connected to uh, my base point with a stability function, with a stable geodesic. Um, so the x and e um, exhaust x um, as and some of grows. And you can also imagine that uh, the, the collection of such n, is n, um, is partially ordered. So I just look at, uh, it's, I say one is bigger than the other if no matter what pair of um, constants I plug in, I always have the one being bigger than the other. Let's, what I, want. I can just write this down fast. So n1 is less than n2 if uh, n of kc is less than n of 2kc um, for all k and c. OK. So what I want to do, I want to define a boundary called the Morse boundary for x. And it's going to be um, the direct limit over the stability functions of the x and e's. And this gives you some nice boundary. The direct limit topology is not necessarily easy to understand, but for instance, a set's open if and only if it's open at each level. Um, but it's kind of a wonky topology to work with, but kind of the theorem here, not due to Matt Cortez, is that um, boundary of the Morse boundary is a quasi-isometry invariant. So if I have the quasi-isometry, quasi oh, so in particular what this means is that no matter which Cayley graph I pick for my group, um, the Morse boundary is topologically the same. OK. Um, so another observation here is that uh, if, if x is hyperbolic, so if it's actually going up hyperbolic, um, then this Morse boundary is equal to the, it's homeomorphic to the Gromov boundary. OK. I'm sorry? It depends on the observation point you structure, right? Um, yeah, right. So if I have, I pick my, it does depend on the observation point. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. Change of base points do induce homeomorphisms, the boundary. I think that's true. Yeah.
right. Um, so we're in a place to state this theorem. Map. Can't break all the chalk. Uh, right. So if I have a subgroup of finally generated group, the following are equivalent. Of one, um, uh, each is stable. It's a stable subgroup. Two, uh, there exists some stability function in such that if I look at the action on one of these strata, these X and E strata, this hyperbolic space, um, then this is a QI embedding. Three, um, so remember these are hyperbolic. So uh, there's some stability function so that if I look at the action on this x and e, uh, this orbit is quasi-convex in the ambient space. And four, this is kind of the main point, is that if I look at the action of h on the weak hull of the limit set of h inside the Morse boundary, then this is co-bounded, which is a slightly weaker condition than co-compact. Um, so here I'm taking, um, this is the limit set of H inside of um, the Morse boundary of G. And you can think about, there's, this, there's a way of defining this Morse boundary just like defining the, the Gromov boundary in terms of sequences of, uh, in your group. And you can think about this limit set as being all of the points in the boundary which can be represented by sequences for entirely in this subgroup. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, so the point, uh, I guess, so I guess the idea is that we've uh, recovered this characterization from the classical setting, which we also had in the context of hyperbolic groups, and we shall also have in the context of um, mapping class groups. And we've generalized this to the broad class of finally generated groups. Um, and I should note that in the case where H is hyperbolic, or G is hyperbolic, then this is precisely Swinson's theorem from earlier in the talk. Um, well, I had more stuff planned, but um, I have no time, so thank you. Any questions? Our, our, um are G, S, X, and X, and E, I mean, so starting at the base point, they're, they're stable, but are the G, S, X, and pairs of points stable with the maybe bigger stability yes. constants? Yes, yes, okay. yeah. yeah. If you take two, yeah, try and, and they're thin, and yeah, this okay. connecting G, S, X is stable, and the, they're all, all the triangles are thin. Yeah, it's really just like, so the, oh, shoot, there's this very important, um, so I need that this, as a subset, um, I'll just write up here. This is a second another condition. As a subset, this is a compact subset. So what compactness tells you is that there's some uniform in so that you're actually just embedding into that stratum, the boundary of that stratum. And then that'll tell you that you're essentially working in a hyperbolic space. And then you need to work a little harder just because you're not actually in a hyperbolic space, um, but the general idea. What's the characterization in Adafin? Okay, so there's no prior characterization in Adafin, but what, what we prove is that um, that if you have a, here's the theorem. This is the Eric Algob, um, and Sam Taylor. Okay, so if uh, so, if we have some subgroup about a thin, such that when the reaction into the free factor graph, um, there's a QI embedding. Um, 
than an H is stable. We don't know so H is a stable subgroup. We don't know whether or not the reverse oh, implication is correct. Oh. Yeah. So if you want to, yeah, so there's this notion of convex compactness due to Hensel and Hammerstadt. And um, yes. So the reason you might care about these subgroups is that there's a similar setup with the surface group extensions that we saw before from the mapping class group. Uh, Dowdell and Taylor prove that if you have a fully atoroidal subgroup of Adafin, which QI embeds into the free factor graph, then it determines a hyperbolic uh, free group extension. And so it turns out that all those, this is a strict subclass of this, so those are all stable subgroups of Adafin too. Um, in a relative hyperbolic case, the, the, you, so what this pulling back stability theorem says is that if I have finally generate group acting properly on a proper geodesic metric space. Um, and I know I have my subgroup that whose orbit is a stable subspace in, the, in, in the, the image space, then that's a stable subgroup. You can pull back the stability in the image space to stability in, in the group. Um, and so in the context of relative hyperbolic groups, um, you could look at the action on the Groves-Manning cusp space, which is a proper hyperbolic space. Um, and so QI embedding into that will tell you then that you're actually stable um, in the original group. And you also get, uh, you also rec from this theorem, you also recover um, an easy proof that convex co-compact and mapping class groups um, implies stability in mapping class groups. Because you just look at the action of the Teichmuller space being quasi-convex there is equivalent to being stable. Um, the action is proper, the space is proper, so you get Any other questions? So we're going to meet in the mailroom in a minute, uh, and we'll go to lunch. Uh, if you're interested in dinner, the plan for dinner is still at 6.30, so you know, shall have a joy for us to join us. OK, let's thank you. Thanks. Thanks.